27 January 1945. So Monday will be the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. 75th anniversary. Uh, I don't know why humans do this, but usually like the 25th, the 50th, the 75th, the 100th. These are milestones we use to mark these occasions. Uh, the 75th anniversaries of liberation, as we were doing these programs throughout the last couple of years, January 1945, I'm looking to I'm like, well, there's only one thing we can do. Right. Auschwitz, the liberation. It makes total sense. Yes, we can talk about some of the other things that are going on in the war, but I think this is probably the most significant event of that period. And it's important uh, with the environment we're seeing today in our country, and in fact around the world with the rise of anti-Semitism, it couldn't be more timely. So it's very important uh, that we remember. Uh, as my co-presenter, Deb Hamilton, is here, who is a uh, teacher out at Northern Potter High School. Does a great job teaching our youth, using echoes and reflections and some of the other programs we used to teach young people about the Holocaust so that it never happens again. That's why we're here. Those of us who have interviewed survivors, they're all the same. They don't want fame, they don't want revenge, they don't want money. They don't want anything. All they want is that we never forget and we tell the young people. I always remember the ones that they always grab your hand. Wow, you touched me. I was at Bergen Belsen at 14. You just touched me, you're a witness. And that's a charge. That's a challenge. They're charging you with the mission of telling other people what they endured. So it's important we do that, and that's one of the reasons we love doing it here. We have our own resident Holocaust scholar, Emily Puskies here. Uh, she also has done the trip. Uh, Deb and Emily both got to go to Poland and to Germany and to visit these sites, and they've both been to Auschwitz recently. And I think there's some others here in the crowd that also have been there recently. I think it should be mandatory. I think everybody should go and see this place, because there are people out there today saying, no, nah, it never happened. That's all fake. And it's our mission, it's part of our job here is to make sure that that is not forgotten and it is shown to be true and it actually really happened. And I wish I couldn't find it, thank God I couldn't, I, I was getting frustrated. But there's a picture recently seen on Facebook of kids, American students, on these railroad tracks into your house going into Birkenau. They're all, hey, take my selfie! Oh, no. On the tracks, coming to Birkenau. Really? Do you even understand the significance of those tracks? Do you realize that was the last train ride for a million people? I think more. Some they say 1.1 million Auschwitz. I don't believe that. I believe it's higher. But at least a million people, that was the last place they saw. And we got people who say, hey, look at me. It's ignorance. They don't know any better. And it's up to us to teach them. It's critical. Absolutely critical. Because those who forget the past, as we know, are condemned to repeat it. So that's why we're doing this program. That's why it's important we remember. Uh, and as I said before, if you get a chance to go to Europe and go to these places, you'll be changed forever. You cannot walk into Dachau or Auschwitz or Birkenau and not feel it. You can smell it. You can feel it. It's, it's the thousands of souls, hundreds of thousands, millions, crying out, don't forget what happened here. So it's very important we do that, and that's why we, we chose this subject. Not the most fun subject to talk about, obviously, um, but probably the most important. So it's very important we do that. We'll go ahead to the next one. I always start these with the situation at the time. Right now, January 1945, the Germans are holding in Italy. Um, narrow, easy to defend peninsula there. They actually stopped us in northern Italy at the end. Um, the Allies are growing stronger. Germany's weaker. The Red Army... Closing in from the east. They're in the western or eastern Poland. They're driving toward Germany. Uh, western Allies are on the Rhine, looking at ways to cross the Rhine. The war in the Pacific is driving on as we're moving through the Pacific. Island hopping campaigns driving toward Japan. That's progressing pretty well. And the Allied bombing offensive is wreaking havoc in Germany. Our heavy bombers pounding the snot out of strategic targets throughout Europe and throughout German-held uh, territory. It's having a major effect. Next one, please. Here's a picture I stuck in there of T-34s and Russian infantry rolling through eastern Poland. Um, unstoppable. The Red Army at this point in January 1945, literally millions of men, hundreds and thousands of tanks, airplanes, guns. You know, the final attack on Berlin, they had guns on a hundred mile sector, wheel to wheel, artillery. I mean, just overwhelming force. The Red Army at this point is a killing machine like we've never seen before. It's an amazing, crude, but very effective killing machine. 
And as they're driving into Europe, they're heading into Poland, they're going to start hitting camps. That's one, please. There's their Stormovic, Red Army Air Force, called the Flying Tank. These things jumped on anything moving on the ground and shot them to pieces. They were very hard to shoot down. Uh, and close air support, and the Russians also copied that from us and, and took it to the next level. Next one, please. Then there's the Americans coming in from the west. I love that picture. That's a Sherman tank with a holdover from Normandy with the rhino uh, hedgerow cutters in the front. And you got the young infantry squad using it for cover. Us infantry guys, we don't want to be in a tank because that's like a big target. But when there's one nearby and there's bullets flying, it's cool to get behind it. It's, it's a good cover, right? But this shows the tank and infantry as a, as a combination. This is how we work in today's modern army as well. Those tanks, once they're buttoned up, hatches are closed, it's hard for them to see. They have a limited vision. So that's nice to have infantry guys outside. Hey, over there, over there. Tanks and infantry work together. Oh, here comes a German tank. Oh, to kill our infantry? That's cool, we got tanks. So it's a team effort. So I always love that picture. It shows those guys working together, but those infantry guys hugging right next to that armor. <coughs> that's, this is the only armor they got, right? They're sure. Next one, please. Our B-17s, pounding Germany in the dust. We have Bart here somewhere whose father flew one of these, was a pilot on one of these aircraft, was shot down. They had his funeral. They, no parachutes were seized, so they declared dead from Smithport. They had his funeral, and uh, he appeared out of the prisoner of war camp at the end of the war. Surprise, I'm not dead. Can you imagine that? The family being devastated and destroyed. Dad's been killed. They're crushed. They have a funeral, and they get a telegram. I'm not really dead. Wow. <laughs> From being in the depths to the to wow. peaks, I can't even imagine as a parent what that must have been like. But our B-17s at this point, in January 1945, they started what's called Big Week. In February, they started pounding strategic targets in Germany. We're massing a thousand. They were called thousand bomber raids. We had a thousand B-17s hitting targets in Germany at once. We overwhelmed them with just incredible air power. Next, please. The camp, main camp, is, uh, oh, I thought that'd be a little bigger. The main camp is known as Auschwitz I. Auschwitz I began construction in February 1940. The first executions were in June. About 10,000 Russian POWs who helped to build some of the camp, they were gassed uh, as the, the first main action at Auschwitz. And it grows to enormous size. This is an aerial view shot in 1944. We're growing even larger. I urge you, get on the internet, there's a video that came out last year, somebody took a drone and flew it up over Auschwitz, over Auschwitz I, and took a, a panoramic view. I was amazed, after studying this my whole life, I never realized how vast. It's a huge camp, huge complex. Um, and it was for one reason, to kill people. It was a factory of death. Uh, so yeah, this is what we kind of from 1944 when there was noises being Jewish people in America saying, why aren't you bombing the tracks going into Auschwitz? Ah, we can't risk assets to an un unsubstantiated target. Then they flew a reconnaissance over the camp and the pilot was like, holy crap, look at this place. It's huge. And he went down a little ways away from the main camp and he saw Birkenau. Ooh, what's that? Then he went a little further, they found Monowitz, the camp where they had all the factories and they were using slave labor, right? Well, we bombed that, but we didn't bomb the tracks coming in. There's still controversy to this day. Why not? Next one, please. Here's a picture of the reception area. The kitchen's on the left. This is a modern photo, recent photograph, but that's kind of what it would look like at that period. Next one, please. Here's a selection ramp at Birkenau. Birkenau II is Auschwitz. It's called Auschwitz II is called Birkenau. That's the killing center. It's about five kilometers from Auschwitz I. And that's what's very famous. You see the your house and the tracks coming in. Uh, that's known as the killing center. It contained the gas chambers and the, the ovens, the crematory. And the first victims, as I said, were those POWs. This picture is from a series of photographs, and you can find it anywhere on the internet. It shows a selection. I believe these were Hungarian Jews that came in. And if you'll notice, they're coming in, whole families, hold hands, everybody together, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles. Okay, we gotta all stay together. Everybody stay together. Everybody stay together. They get up in front of the, the camp doctor. And he determines, you guys, all the kids over here, all the elderly folks over here, the rest of you this way, where are they going? Oh, they're going to the kindergarten and the older folks' home. Yeah, that's called a gas chamber. Those people will be dead in 30 minutes. Imagine that. That's the last time you see your kids or your parents or your grandparents watching each other going in different lines. This line up here, these people did not make the cut. That's crematoria too right here. They're heading toward the gas chamber. 
There's a lot of stuff on the internet. There's a lot of literature. There's an amazing model that was built that shows the street to heaven, the gas chamber, the undressing room. It's all. It's a model. It's a scale model. It is stunning. I believe it's in Washington. Is that yes. in Washington? Mm -hmm. It's incredible. If you ever get a chance, to look at this. It shows them undressing. That shows them going into the. Well, this is a shower, right? Yeah. No, it's not. It's a gas chamber. It's horrific. It's hard to read this stuff. It's hard to understand how people could do this to other people. Somebody, I uh, just loaned this book to a lady who just brought this back, Martin Gilbert's book, The Holocaust. If you can read this without crying, you are a very strong person. Some of the stories in here, unbelievable. I can't imagine people could do this, and they did. The lessons are pretty clear. So that's Birkenau, Auschwitz uh, II, that was called. Uh, and that was a killing center. That's all they did. There was nothing produced there. There was no labor. There was nothing but death. And you see, I like this picture too because it shows Sonder Commando. Other Jews working, they, they kept them fed. They, they were not skinny and skeletal looking. They gave them cigarettes and let them work, live a little bit longer if they told the new arrivals, oh, this is a work camp. Don't worry. It's all going to be fine. Grandma and Grandpa will be back later. You'll see them later. And they helped. They gathered their belongings. They put them, oh, yeah, that's all going to your barracks. We'll send them to your barracks. Yeah, they helped with the deception, these Sonder Commando. That was their job to tell these people. Now, some of them had a lot of courage, and they would tell a kid, how old are you, kid? I'm 14. You tell them you're 15. Tell them you're 16. Tell them you're older. You'll be selected for life rather than death. You got a trade? No, I don't have any trade. Tell them you're a shoe sale or a shoe cobbler or you're a tailor. I don't know anything. Just tell them. So when they get to the front of the line, what do you do? Oh, I'm a shoe I'm a cobbler. Okay, <coughs> or it's, oh, I don't have the skill, death. So sometimes those sergeant commanders would try to help and save people in, the, in those lines. A lot of them they couldn't. A recent donation to Yad Vashem was a letter written by a group when the Hungarian Jews got there. Uh, this one family went through selection. They selected everybody for life except one, the 16-year-old son. He had a limp. Oh, death, gas chamber. As they selected him off to the side, the mother said, I can't let him go by himself. She said, I'm going with him. They said, go. And so she went with her son to the gas chamber. But before she left, this is the part that astounds me. She's sitting on the side of the trail that the trucks are going to come to take into the gas chamber. She asked for a piece of paper from a guard. And the guard gave it to her. And she wrote a letter to her husband. Take care of our kids. Remember us forever. This most heart-wrenching, most beautiful letter you'll ever read. And she gave it to the guard and said, we give it to my husband. And he did, which really blows me away. And it survived. And he just recently donated to Yad Vashem to read. Can you imagine that? Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. The scenes at this ramp, I can't even imagine. And you got kids bouncing on the railroad tracks. They didn't even take my selfie. Unbelievable. Next one, please. The camp person, Auschwitz III, starts in April of 41. Located seven kilometers from the main camp, it's called Monowitz, is where the, the, the plants are. These are involved in war production using slave labor from Auschwitz I. Buna Works, IG Farben, Bayer, Ashburn Company, uh, Siemens, uh, Krupp. They all said, the German government said, the Nazis said, hey, we got a ton of free slave labor right here. If you locate a plant, a munitions plant or a war plant near Auschwitz, we'll supply you with free labor. Free labor, woohoo! That cuts down the overhead. Don't gotta feed them. Don't gotta water them. When they die. Just put another one in there. Bonus. So they did. So they built a, a construction of there began. They built uh, synthetic rubber and synthetic fuel. They built a couple of different war production uh, products there. And this picture is kind of a famous one. This is Himmler inspecting monoids uh, during the construction of the camp. What I like about this picture, um, a lot of people don't study the war and don't realize who this guy is. That's Joachim Piper. Piper led the Waffen SS troops during the Battle of the Bulge that shot our prisoners in the Malmody Massacre. After the war, he was held on trial and he claimed, I was a soldier. I didn't do that. I didn't order that. Well, he didn't order that execution, but he was the charge. He was in charge, so you take responsibility for your troops, right? But he swore up and down he had nothing to do with the gas chambers and with the Holocaust. <coughs> There he is. He was Himmler's adjutant. Here he is inspecting Monowitz at Auschwitz in 1941. So during the trial, the, the, the trial of the SS at Dachau, he got up and said, I was a soldier. And they pulled out all these pictures of him with Himmler 
at Auschwitz. <laughs> yeah, sure you are. Scary. It's a great picture. Next one. The camp itself. The last transport came from Lotz at the end of October 1944. About 70,000 from Treisienstadt and some of the other camps. As the Russians are closing in, they don't want the Jews to fall into enemy hands. About 70,000 of them are brought into Auschwitz from the Lotz, mainly about 60,000 from the Lotz ghetto. Very few of them survived. Very few of them were selected for work. They were gassed immediately and burned. Uh, Hitler orders the gassing to cease in November and to begin the destruction of the camps. He saw the writing on the wall. He started thinking, hey, I can bargain with these Jews' lives. You know, I'll keep a bunch of Jews alive and I'll make concessions with the Allies. He thought, they actually were dealing trade trucks for Jews. There was all kinds of plans. Jews outside of Germany trying to come up with ways to save what was left of the Jews of Europe. So, hey, yeah, they want some trucks. Trade them some trucks for some Jews, for some lives. He saw Schindler's List, how he worked deals trying to save people. I try to teach that to kids, and when I talk about the Holocaust, they're overwhelmed with the evil. Kids look at this and go, wow, how could people be so evil? I said, I know, right? That's what sparked my interest, I think, as a young person. How could they do this? But for all the evil you see here, there was incredible goodness. There were people trying to save Jews, people trying to rescue them. I always talk about the year Obama got the Nobel Prize. He was elected the president, first black president, and he got the Nobel Prize. That same year, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Obama. Karina Sandova from Warsaw was up for the Nobel Prize. She was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew, but she had a pass. She could get in and out of the Warsaw ghetto. So she started smuggling Jews out. She put them in her underwear under her peasant skirt and one in her toolbox. Right out the gate she went. Wow, that was easy. She, she made a harness. She sewed a harness to put a baby under her skirt and made an extra false bottom on her, on her work box or her uh, toolbox so she could take two kids out. She's smuggling three at a time. She smuggled 1,500 kids out of the ghetto. Wow. She was caught. She was beat to death. The Germans said, you're not worth a bullet. So they started beating her with her, their Mauser rifles, very much like this one. Nine pound rifle with steel butt plates. They just started beating her. They beat her to death. Once they left her for dead, they walked away. She wasn't dead. She was still alive. She waited until it got dark, started crawling down the street. Somebody rescued her, took her in. She regained her health, went back to smuggling Jews out of the ghetto. Wow. You're looking for role models, you're looking for heroes, World War II's full of them. So for all the evil you see, there was goodness. There were people trying to help. There's some really amazing stories. How many of you ever knew about the guy that broke into Auschwitz? <clears throat> it's a true story. People broke into Auschwitz to record what was going on and escape and tell the world. Remember, Jews escaped from Auschwitz and, and reported to the American government, it's a death factory. It's not a concentration camp. You gotta bomb the tracks, you gotta do something, they're killing 10,000 a day there. We went, oh, come on. That's crazy. These are the people who gave us Einstein and Beethoven. They couldn't do this. Yeah, they did. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So by January 20th, the crematory is destroyed, and Canada is burned. Canada was what they called a series of warehouses on Auschwitz I, where all the goods taken from the Jews were sorted and searched and categorized. There was a table where all the cash went, another table where all the gold, another table jewelry, another table clothing. It was huge. The prisoners called it Canada because Canada they saw as the land of milk and honey and freedom and richness. So they called that complex Canada. That was burned. The Germans looted it and then burned it so nobody else could get it. Typical, right? I think burned for five days in the warehouses. And it's kind of tragic because there's a lot of food in there. Uh, again, Hitler orders no Jews to fall alive in enemy hands and begins the death marches. I mean, really? I'm always amazed in my study of World War II, especially on the Eastern Front, the German generals are screaming, we need ammo, we need reinforcements, we need supplies. Hitler's like, no, 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 I need those trains to run Jews to Auschwitz. He prioritized killing of the Jews over supplying his soldiers on the Eastern Front. So trains that should have been carrying ammunition and bringing wounded back were carrying Jews to their death. Right to the end. They couldn't, they couldn't think the thought that, oh my gosh, I might not get them all? That bothered them. It's, really, it's an amazing story. At the end, the Russians arrive on the January 27th. There are about 7,000 survivors. Now, numbers are kind of vague, loosey-goosey, but about 7,000 survivors at Auschwitz. They were all too sick to go on the death march. 
The death march claimed a lot of lives. If you didn't keep up, they shot you on the spot. There's clandestine photographs of Germans through the windows of their house watching these clouds of Jews walk by skeletons in their striped jammies. The Germans are taking pictures, you know. Um, remember, the Holocaust was not to be recorded. Germans put out strict orders, no photographs of the camps, no photographs of the Einsatzgruppen, the special action groups that are operating in the East. None of that is to be put on any record. There's never been an order found from Hitler to kill the Jews. It was all verbal. The Wannsee Conference, they made some plans, but there was nothing there that said we will implement the final solution to the Jewish question. But who ordered it? We all know. It was Hitler, right? Because Hitler's making his uh, negotiations thinking Hitler actually thought Hitler was going to die and he's going to take over Germany and we negotiate with Hitler. Really? That's how these people thought. There's no chance of that happening. So at this point, we've gotten here, uh, like I said, when the Russians liberated the camp, they were stunned. This is the Red Army, a horrible killing machine. These guys are brutal, savage killers. That front line, front echelon, that the Ukrainian Guard Army, they were killers. And they got to Auschwitz, they were stunned. They were crying, they were upset, just like our guys. When our guys started overrunning camps in the West, our guys hardened combat vets, bursting into tears. Because they saw these, what they call human wrecks. Struggle toward them. Imagine a skeleton covered with striped pajamas, covered with vermin, smelling horrible, comes up to you and tries to grab your hand and kiss your hand. You're finally here. When we were doing the research for the some of these photographs, I was looking at some of the videos. There's always one I love. This guy sitting, he's scared. He's sitting off to the side. He's holding on this piece of pipe. He's scared. He's not sure what's happening. Well, some Americans are here. And he's, I think it's Buchenwald. And he's holding on to this thing, and he finally goes, starts going like this, and they pick him up. Oh, he choked up. They put him on a stretcher, and the whole time he's going, oh, they're here. They saved us. They're finally here. Imagine thousands of people that we rescued died anyway. We liberated, but they were too far gone to save. When our guys got to Doc Alley, they saw these people. Oh my God, these guys hadn't had any food in months. I got a Hershey bar left over from lunch. I got a sandwich from their dinner. And they'd give it to them and they would die. They'd eat it and it would kill them. It was too many calories at once. Somebody's living on 200, 300 calories a day, gets a 25,000 calorie game bar or something, they killed them. So our medics would run in there, don't give them any food. We'll slowly bring them back with chicken broth and bread and just slowly build their health up. We lost thousands after liberation. That's how bad they were. To Eisenhower's everlasting credit, and I always tell this story in the Holocaust room, Eisenhower, we ran over in Ordruf in the West. We didn't believe the Russians. Now in February, the Russians started filming. And we, that's all, a lot of the film we have today. I was from the Russians at Auschwitz. You'll see them marching all the, the twins going through the fence, uh, all the other things. The Russians took a lot of film of that, which is good. We didn't believe it. We, a lot of us said that's baloney. That can't be true. Then we hit Ordruf, which is a subcamp of uh, Buchenwald. We sent a letter up to chain. We don't know what this is. You need to come see this. And Eisenhower, God bless him, Eisenhower said, well, I'll go. Eisenhower, the head of all Allied forces in Europe, shows up at Ordruf, and there's film, get on the internet, there's film of this on YouTube. His face, he is so angry. He walks in there, he's with Patton and Bradley. They walk in, they go through the first building, they come out, Patton throws up, gets in his car and leaves. They go to the second building, Bradley comes out, he's green. He gets in his car, he leaves. They go to the third building, the fourth building, the fifth building, Beale Smith says, General Eisenhower, you've seen enough, we can go now. He goes, no, I want to see every building on this camp. But, but why? There's like 100 buildings here. He says, I don't care. I want to see them all. But why, General? Well, I'll use his language. He said, because someday, 10, 20, maybe 50 years from now, some son of a bitch is going to say this never happened. I want to be here with my own eyes to see it. Then he went back and ordered all his soldiers who could be spared, go see these camps. You might not know what you're fighting for, but you'll know what you're fighting against. A lot of our soldiers didn't know. They were fighting across here. All these politicians, what did they get us into? And we started running into the camps. We're like, oh my God, that's why we're here. I tell young people all the time, nobody wants to fight. I'm all about negotiating, compromising. Let's make a deal. Let's get together. Why can't we work together? Why do we got to fight? We're so divided in this country right now. It's, it's appalling. 
It's appalling. I tell kids, those of us who've lost friends in war, we don't want to fight, man. I'm telling you, it's a horrible thing. Sometimes you gotta fight. <clears throat> World War II was one of those times. When kids come in here and they ask, well, why did we fight the war? So come on, take them right into the Holocaust room. This is why we fought the war. And this started not overnight. These, like I said, these are the people who gave us some of the great thinkers of our time. This started slowly, <coughs> slowly demonizing, slowly, slowly teaching young people, hey, 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 there's a book in the Holocaust Room, and I urge you to check out the Holocaust Room that we found recently uh, up in, in the library on the shelf. It didn't have a, uh, any letters on the binding, so I pulled it out. It's hand in hand with the fatherland. It's a first grade book for German kids issued in the early 30s, 34, 35, to first graders. You open it up, it says A, B, C, one, two, three, triangle, square, circle. The dog chases the cat, the cat chases the mouse, and sings some songs, and you flip the page over, Adolf Hitler is God. Jews are rats. And you flip the page, oh, all the kids around the maypole, ha, ha. yeah, who oh, yeah, we're going to grandpa's house, yeah, yeah. And you flip the page, Jews are dirty. Hitler is God. I mean, all through this book. Mm -hmm. So by the time they're 18, yeah, I'll shoot them into a ditch. Why not? They're rats. That's how it starts. So I always give the kids a challenge. If you're walking down the hallway in your school, you see some little kid getting beat up, getting bullied, getting pushed around, do you stop and help that kid or do you walk by? Oh, I'd stop and help. I hope so, because World War II, we walked by from the beginning. Remember, World War II didn't start in 1941 in Pearl Harbor. It didn't start 1 September 39 in Poland. It started in 1931 in China. And I'll tell you, by 1937, when the Nazis tell the Japanese, you need to tone it down, that's how bad it was going in China, in Far East Asia. The, some of the things the Japanese did to the people, the Germans, well, imagine how bad it must be if the Nazis are telling you to tone it down. <laughs> Trust me, I just did a six month study of the war in the Pacific, of Jap specifically Japanese atrocities in the Pacific. There's about 10 different books up there. I went through, read them all. Oh my God. Stunning. The inhumanity. So if you got the Nazis telling you to tone it down, holy crap, that's pretty bad. So I tell young people, it's up to you. Us old timers, we've done our turn. It's up to you guys. Learn your history, understand what it means, and never let this happen again. Us old guys, I tell I hope you're sitting in my rocking chair pretty soon, right? Oh, pee my pants again, darn it. No. <laughs> what? Judge Judy's on? Yes! <laughs> Guess who's running the country? Our young people. Very scary. Some of them come in here, I swear to God. Oh my God, WWII, what's that? <laughs> scary. Thank God there are teachers out there that are doing the work, that are making the effort, because I'll tell you, there's a lot of kids that come here that are clueless. And you get the other ones that come in here. We had one not long ago. I won't say what school, public or private school. He comes in. He goes, excuse me, sir. I go, yeah. He goes, do you think if Chamberlain would have stood up to Hitler at Munich in 38, we could have avoided the war altogether? I was like, oh, my God, yes. Yes. I loved them. Yes, go tell your friends. So, so important. It's not important that they understand the details of the Treaty of Versailles, the Weimar Republic, or the Bolshevik Revolution. All they need to know, it was good versus evil. And always stand up against evil. Niemöller said it best. First they came for the social democrats, I didn't say anything, I wasn't a social democrat. Then they came for the homosexuals, I didn't say anything, I wasn't a homosexual. Then they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything, I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, there was no one left to speak for me. That's on, I believe that's written somewhere in one of the camps, Auschwitz, that's, they use that as one of their things. It's so important that our young people are taught what this means. And it's so important they never let it happen again. We tracking? North, south? Yeah? You sweat? No? You sweat? No? Are antennas are not special? Are there any antennas? No? Okay. Any questions of me at this point? No? What I want to do now, I have taken you up to the point. You go ahead and get to the next one. I've taken you up to the point of the, of the day of. 27 January. These are staged photos. There's a guy from Russia. They're all hugging on him, right? This guy looks a little chunky to be a prisoner, but there were some early uh, that were recently added that were still pretty decent health. Next one, please. And then, of course, the last one. The kids showing their tattoos. Little kids. These ones survived. Many of them survived because they just hadn't gotten to them yet. Or they were using them for experimental purposes. 
Um, it's just mind-boggling. Who can hurt children? They had no problem. They were taught they were rats. They were vermin. And those are the, some of the survivors. At this point, we're going to take a couple-minute break, and I'm going to introduce our next presenter, Deb Hamilton from Northern Potter High School. She is our one of our experts, and she is uh, your Echoes and Reflections. I'm tied with them. Um, that is a, 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 a group show, a started, I guess, a show foundation. The Yad Vashem National Memorial, uh, Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, uh, has this program called Echoes and Reflections to help educators, teachers mainly, uh, tell the story, how to teach this to kids, because it's kind of hard to wrap your head around some of these concepts, especially as a high school kid. So these people, like Deb, and this is what I love about her, these people seek out this stuff. Because there's a lot of teachers out there that ask, that's more work, I don't need it. They, don't, they, they do just enough to get their paycheck and go out. Uh, you know they're out there, not all of them, but there's some, there's some out there that just don't do that extra work. She's one of these people that does whatever she can to get the story to the kids. Because she, I think she realizes, as young as she is, she realizes as well how important it is that the youth understands what happened here. And she, these people crack me up too, her and Emily both, oh, we'll never get to go there. Yeah, they both got to go. You know, there's thousands of people that apply for these trips, uh, and you have to be selected, and they both got to go. So we're a beneficiary. We're still milking uh, Emily's brain there, trying to get out. She's, she uh, did Warsaw, they did, uh, they've did. been to Berlin, they've been all over the place. So they're, they've done a, a great job. And like I said, they're now witnesses. They've been <coughs> they're witnesses. And that's why she's here today. So welcome her today. my trip with a few things. I am a child who was riddled with anxiety. I'm afraid of everything. Um, I'm terrified to fly. Um, I don't like to be alone. I never crave alone time. Um, I think I aggravate my husband sometimes because I'm like, well, do you just want to go? Do you? I don't ever want to be by myself, ever, ever. I am the most independent, codependent person you are ever going to meet in the face of the world. Um, so I, a couple years ago, social studies teacher, another social studies teacher came to me and said, hey, this Echoes and Reflections thing is coming to the IUI in, Smith, in Smithport, and the law just changed, and kids have to have so many hours of Holocaust education before um, they can graduate. Would you be interested in going to this training with me? And I was like, sure. Day out of the classroom, sounds great. Did the training, went for the day, had lunch out. It was awesome. But the resources were amazing, and the presenter was amazing. And so I kind of like, you know, put it on the back burner, continued through the school year, and the next time an Echoes thing came up that was close, relatively close by, I went for a second year and got kind of the booster to that first course. They gave us lots of resources. And I came right back and I thought, how can I put this in my classroom? Like, this stuff is really good. How can I work with the ELA teacher and get this stuff into, into my classroom? Where can I fit it into Pennsylvania standards? And so we kind of started working and collaborating together and um, figured it out. Well, I'm on the Echoes and Reflections Facebook page because like, there's thousands of educators from all over the United States and uh, the world, really, and they had announced for the first time ever a, a private donation came in to Yad Vashem in Israel, and they decided to earmark, earmark that money for a trip to Poland. They were going to choose 20 educators from across the United States, and I thought, I'm never going to get it, but maybe... And so I sort of started thinking about it, and then would talk myself out of it because I'm afraid to fly. And I started thinking about it, and then I would talk myself out of it because the application process was really, really long, and I have three kids at home. And then I would talk myself into it and get hyped out, and then I would type my, talk myself out of it. And one afternoon, it was Marshall's turn on like a winter day to pick TV, and he doesn't watch the same stuff I watch, and I was like, well, I'm just going to go out to the office and check this thing out again. And so I sat down and I applied. I kind of forgot about it because it was like a needle in a haystack shot and when I usually run the statistics on things, I don't end up really lucky. And so I was just kind of like, well, I applied and it is what it is. Well, the first round came out and I was not one of the 20. I was number 21. I was the first, I was the first loser. And so I said, but if somebody doesn't take that trip, and I was like, who would not take that trip? But as it turned out, somebody did not take that trip. So out of all of those applications that came in, about a month after they announced the first kind of string of people, I got a call that said, um, Mazel Tov, congratulations, you're going to Poland. And then I was like, I'm going to Poland. 
I have to get on an airplane. <laughs> Without my husband. All by myself to a foreign country where I don't know the language, I don't really know anything about it, and well, here we go. I booked that plane ticket by myself, I drove to Toronto by myself, I parked in the parking by myself, and got on the shuttle to the airport. I did it all by myself. I met people who became some of my very best friends, even to this day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of touch on real quick liberation, and then I just kind of want to show you my experience and my pictures being at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Go ahead. So again, um, this is all just, you know, review, but 33 to 35, um, Adolf Hitler, um, the persecution of Europe's Jews and this idea that they're going to wipe them out. This becomes like the biggest genocide in the time period of our history. We now today call it the Holocaust. Um, Again, we have millions dead, we have lives shattered, we have generations. When I talk to my kids about this at school, I don't talk about how, you know, make, so we just lost six plus million people. What is the ripple effect of what they lost? And a lot of times standing at these camps, at nighttime we would go back to the hotel, and I kind of am one of those people that I was like, it'll be fine, it's history, it's history, I can compartmentalize this, I will be fine. It, it wasn't fine. Um, I came home for weeks after, even months after I couldn't sleep. I felt stupid saying that I couldn't sleep. I finally, somebody in our group said, is anybody else having trouble sleeping? And I was like, oh my gosh, it's not just me. Okay, and so we kind of like worked through some of, the, some of that. So in the processing, it occurred to me, what was wiped out in six million people? What was, what was lost? A cure for AIDS? A cure for cancer maybe? Moms, dads, brothers, sisters, families generations of families is what was lost. Stuff that we won't even know. Peacekeepers, presidents, prime ministers. We just don't know. We just don't know because they never had a chance. When you talk about 1.5 million, my kids always say to me, that's a lot. It's a lot. I don't want you to focus on the numbers and the statistics because they, come over, they become overwhelming. I try to pick people and stories and families and connect kids back to history that way because they aren't going to remember. If they'll remember it for the test, yes. 1.5 million children, Mrs. Hamilton, I will write it for you and you can correct it and give me 100. I want them to know the faces of the Frank family. I want them to know the faces of the Bizell family. I want them to know what those 1.5 million looked at. I want them to take a story, learn it, put it in their heart, and maybe someday, somewhere, share it somewhere else. So, just the magnitude of what was lost. Click back. Yeah, like, keep on. Yeah, there you go. So here's Liberation Day in the United States. It's exciting, right? Like, they just, didn't they just recreate this photo? Not super long ago? Yeah, and it's a great photo. I love it. When I see this, this, like, makes my heart so happy. I am a proud American. I am a proud supporter of our U.S. troops. I'm a proud American. And this, to me, is proud America. Like, this is what the end of a war should look like. But then there's this. These are the staged photos. So when we come into these camps, we find these people. And we know that this is not entirely what it looks like. They come in and they stage photos because I really do believe that people could not have seen on the front of Time Magazine what it was really like. It would have made people sick. And so they stage photos to say, like, this is, you know, like, this is what was here. And now, today, we know that it's more like this. This is what we see. We see mass graves filled with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins and families and generations. We see piles of shoes and piles of eyeglasses. And one of my favorite um, pictures that I have in my room, the kids like it because they're in seventh and eighth grade and it's got a swear word on it. And it's a postcard of just thousands of pairs of glasses. And it said, what in the hell does somebody need thousands of pairs of glasses for? But anything that they could steal from these people, they stole and repurposed. This is the casualty of war. Not those pictures before. They're staged for magazines. This is what war looks like. And this is what it looked like when we come into Auschwitz-Birkenau. Go ahead. So of course they got to cover this stuff up. Steve touched on it. I'm not going to touch on it again. I'm going to tell you standing there, it was very interesting, the story of Canada. 
Um, Canada, the land of riches, the land of wealth. Everybody sees Canada kind of as this like warm, soft, and fuzzy feel good place. I even still kind of do today. Like they're our, our sweet northern neighbor. Um, if I was going to borrow bread, that's where I would probably go. Um, just Canada. And the Europeans saw it this way too, the land of wealth. Well, the, the Jews, part of their job, part of the Zondo commander job was to take the stuff and organize it out. Things from prams, so strollers, prams, um, glasses, hair, um, money, jewelry, anything that they thought was of any worth, fillings from teeth, um, you name it, um, prosthetic legs. Anything that they could take and repurpose from the Jews, they took and repurposed from the Jews. Cameras. When the Nazis at the time of liberation, they know. They know it's closing in. They start marching the people out in death marches. And Elie Wiesel, the famous book Night, he talks about the, that death march. And his dad falling and, get up, dad, you have to get up. We just have to keep moving. He talks about that. They're marching, marching, moving, moving. The Nazis set Canada on fire to try and cover it up. They, dis they dismantled the, um, the crematoriums, they set it on fire, and it burns so hot because there's so much stuff in it that the, when, the, um, when the Red Army comes in, they can't put it out. It just burns and burns and burns, and I'll show you what those pictures look like today. Um, look again. So again, death marches, it, people just moving, moving, moving. If you fell, you die. The end. And we're not talking about a zillion miles, but when you are already on the brink of death, they're moving you again, you're exhausted, and I, the kids will always say to me, Mrs. Hamilton, why didn't they just lay down and die? Like, well, it's that, that, un, that everlasting hope. Any survivor I've ever met talks about hope. I had to live. I had to be a witness so that this can never happen to another group of people again. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe they'll come for us tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. There's these constant stories of hope and the human will to live. So here's part of Canada. Um, you can just see it's just piled. It's just piled high. That is, is there's that's a barracks, and so it's as tall as a barrack, and they're kind of rifling and sorting through. So of course, when it goes up, you guys know how house fires go up. Depending on what's in that house, when it goes up, it goes up and it burns hot. <coughs> Um, this is my picture, and this is um, what part of Canada looks like today. So you'll see here in those barracks were um, like, chip, like there were like chimney flues, and of course that stayed because it's it's concrete. But I mean, it was just as vast. It was just like as far as you could see, just burned down um, foundations of these barracks that they stored things in. These are also my pictures. Um, this is the crematoriums that were destroyed. The story that they told us standing here, um, and I'll show you what, what an actual crematorium that they did not destroy looks like. But the crematorium, kind of the roof came on top of it, but it wasn't super high above the ground. It was all sort of underground. And a Nazi guard would stand here, and the Jews would come along here, and there was kind of like this greenery area, and they would come around and go down the steps. And the Nazi guard would stand there, and a lot of people described him as very, like, paternal. He, he would say things like, when you get out of the shower, you tell them that the guard at the front thinks you would be a great chef. You should work in the kitchen. You should be in the garden. You should be in the tool shop. And he constantly was just feeding them with his gun in hand, right, crowd control, feeding them this idea that we're going to be okay. And so when people say things like, I don't understand, they arrived at Auschwitz, why didn't they rebel? Some of them really did not know until they were in. And then it's too late. There's a mother standing here who figures it out real quick. She's got her baby, and she says, I will go. Keep my baby. Take my baby from me. Save my baby. And they very quickly push her and the baby in. So this is what it looks like. It's all kind of underground. Um, the gas chamber would be this way, and then the crematorium would be straight back. And it was just a constant killing factory. If it got backed up, they would just put the Jews over here in like this yard where they would hang out until it was their turn. And again, you can argue at that point they had to know. How did they not know? I still am going to argue back 
that I don't think that they all knew because I see pictures from that, that time period, clandestine pictures taken and Nazi pictures taken, and nobody looks alarmed. They look exhausted, they don't look super scared, the children don't look super scared, and if I knew that I was going to my death, and if I knew that that's how I was going to die, I don't know that that picture of me would not look incredibly different. That I would run, I don't know. But they look very, very calm, like they're waiting to be processed into the barracks. Go ahead. So again, <coughs> We can come back to this, but genocide didn't stop with the Holocaust. We still have genocide today. And so one of the things when I show the, um, show the kids the pictures of my slideshow and we kind of work through that together, I always tell them to keep an open mind and remember that the Holocaust was not the first and only genocide in the history of man. We have to kind of remember that as we move forward because everything that you do matters. Everything that you say matters. Everything that you believe matters. So we're going to switch real quick, and I'll walk you through Birkenau. A lot of people believe that the Jews did not fight back or resist. There are many, many recorded instances, uprisings at Sobibor. Yeah. They saved up explosives and blew up one of the crematoria at Auschwitz. They knew it wouldn't have any effect, but they had to do something to show the world, hey, we're not going out like this. So there were many, as she said, a lot of them did not have a clue until they were in the gas chamber. That's how well camouflaged it was. But there were those who did know, like the breakout at Sobibor, the uprising, there was an uprising in Treblinka and at Auschwitz where they blew up the crematoria. Uh, and so it's not like they went meekly to their deaths. Most of them, of course, did. What do you do in the face of machine guns and dogs? And you're naked. You really don't have much choice. But there were many times where there was uprisings and there were people trying to fight back <coughs> against them. I'm not going out this way. And they did fight. Yeah. So this is, um, this is kind of the welcome center at Auschwitz, um, at Auschwitz Birkenau. This that you see up top, um, and these are all my pictures. I took all of these. This up top is um, what they call the gates of hell. This is the gates of hell into the death factory. You can see um, that the railroad tracks kind of go right in. And keep in mind, I'm going to come back to it, this is a one-way train ticket. It's a one-way train ticket. The B is upside down. We had a long conversation in my classroom about that. Um, many of the signs made at Auschwitz and at Birkenau were made by prisoners, and they used to flip the bee upside down because they wanted to the world to know that this was the most upside down place in the entire universe. And so that was one of their resistance ways of saying, we're going to tell the world, we're going to share our story. So again, the tracks, they kind of come straight in. They go for as long as you can see. So um, this is like outside, this would be the train coming in. They open these gates. It's all heavily guarded, and the trains pull in. This is a train car that they actually put, um, that they put back, they restored and they put back at Birkenau. And one of the things that kind of stuck with me about this, because again, I am such a wear my heart on my sleeve kind of person. I'm interested in the history, but I'm interested in the human story. What did it feel like? What did it look like? How long were you on that train? Was it the dead of summer and it was so hot you thought you were suffocating? Or was it the dead of winter and you were almost freezing to death? I think about my grandmother. I think about my mother. I think about my own children and my own family. They had to jump down out of these rail cars. I picture my 75-year-old grandmother trying to get out of this rail car while people are screaming, dogs are barking, they are moving them as fast as they can. I picture my grandmother trying to hold on to her suitcase and get everybody rounded up off of this train car and try to be following directions as well because again, we think that we're just getting moved away from the war front at this point. This train car, when I stood next to it, my head came to about here. So it's quite a jump. It's quite a jump. I think about babies. I think about moms carrying babies. I think about moms carrying babies and baby things and having the toddler here and trying to balance all of that and get everybody safely off this car. 
And remember, many of them are moving from a ghetto situation, so they're already tired, they're already hungry, they're already starving. They're already feeling frustrated. And maybe sweating to death or freezing to death. Go ahead. So this is where selection happens. Um, this is where like all the famous pictures are taken. There's a lot of pictures taken from the tops of train cars. And they're taken by Nazi officers, Nazi soldiers, just sort of keeping an account of what's going on. Um, you get up here to this barracks, and this is where selection happens. So, how old are you? Do you have any health conditions? To the left meant one thing, to the right meant something completely different. This is the point, when I stood here, the magnitude was not lost on me. This is the point where most people never saw their families again. Because remember, at Birkenau, families are separated at all of the camps. Families are separated, and we don't just kill a few from a family. For some people, generations of families are killed. There's nobody left that is blood related to that family which gets us into a whole other thing when we start memorializing them, when we start talking about what the cemeteries look like, and we start talking about what these final resting places look like. Go ahead. <coughs> so one of the things that our tour guide did from Yad Vashem is she brought original pictures that she borrowed um, or had from um, just the Yad Vashem library, and then she showed us um, a photograph, and then we stood there. So it was kind of like, from where I stand, this is what it looked like, and this is what it looked like today. You can see in the picture, even though it's a little bit fuzzy, I tried to do this for my students so that they could really sort of understand, instead of just trying to visualize it. It's just wall-to-wall -wall masses of people. It's the most organized chaos that probably anyone would have ever experienced in their entire life. And here they are getting off the train, and just as fast as they're getting off the train, I imagine that some of them were like, but I need my bags, I need my suitcase, I need my stuff, my, the baby stroller is here. And the Zondra commandos say to them, we'll take care of your stuff. We'll move it where it needs to get moved. Relax, go get in line. Knowing that those people were walking away from those things forever. So again, here's the original picture of a line. Um, this is what it looked like the day that I was there. You can see this picture. Um, I always say to my kids, how do you know which way they're going? If you know nothing about the layout of the camp, how do you know which way? And they say, well, Mrs. Hamilton, you can see um, there, there's a kid, there's, a, like, there's like a toddler here. Yes. And you can see that there's an older, like, you know, an older lady. I blow it up a little bit bigger so you can see it. And because I did the same exact walk from those train tracks, I know which way they're going. They're walking straight to the crematorium. This is the group that did not make selection. So this is um, Eli Wiesel. Eli Wiesel is uh, amazing. His book is amazing. If you've never picked it up, pick it up. You won't be able to put it down until you're done. Make sure your chores are, make sure your chores are done and that you can sit and give yourself the afternoon. Um, Eli Wiesel is a young boy at the time of the Holocaust. His dad and his mom and his sister Zipporah are all in on the same transport. His mom and his sister um, are not selected to work. Eli and his dad are. He talks about the last time he saw his sister. She was in her red coat from the holiday. Um, he talks about how she, how she was dressed. And he says, that's the last time I ever saw her. If you're not interested in the book because reading is not your thing, um, I show my kids the clip, Ellie Weisel goes back to Auschwitz with Oprah Winfrey. Yes. I don't know. I, I can't use I, I don't have the words. But it will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Um, he tours it with her. He talks to her about it. He sat on, the, um, on the, the panel of people and with the designers when they were putting the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. from the location, from what was going to be there, from how it was going to lay out, from what quotes were going to be used. He was right in the mix of all of that planning and preparation, which I think is just an amazing testament that the Jews really don't want payback. They want never again. They never want families and generations of families to suffer the way that they suffer. So this is Ellie, and this is the path that he walks at night. And I'm not going to read you the whole excerpt, but if you read it in the book, you'll have to put it down and walk away. I mean, it's really, it's got a lot of meat to it. He describes it perfectly. And one of the things that he sees is um, a truck, and the truck gets unloaded 
with, uh, with, with bodies of children. And he walks by as a 15-year-old boy. They make selection, and they're walking. And the SS guards make them think that they're walking to this fire to jump in. And he's kind of going back and forth with, if there is a God, how is this happening? And if this is happening, how is the rest of the world saying nothing? And he goes back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes he says, I, his dad says to him, so imagine a father saying to their 15-year-old son, I wish you just would have gone with your mom and Zipporah. Mm -hmm. Knowing where they went, he doesn't want to witness the death of his son. And so I'm going to just read to you this little... Um, this little excerpt, but this is where they walked. This would be the walk that they're taking um, when he's reflecting back and writing the book night. Uh, Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, that turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me of all eternity, the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget those things, even if I were condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Ellie Buzel spoke a few years ago at Chautauqua, and yeah. I had the privilege of hearing him. It was amazing. Yeah. And it was after Bernie Madoff stole his personal wealth and that of his foundation. She talked about that. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing man. And actually, the kids always, you know, this was a long time ago, Mrs. Hamilton, and my hook is always, you're right, this was a long time ago. So why two summers ago was L.A. Buzel's childhood home sabotaged with swastikas spray painted all over it? If this was that long ago, and this is really history, then why are we seeing it repeating itself? And unfortunately, the acts of anti-Semitism, we talk about the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. I mean, it's happening every day. I don't have to go far in the news archives, you know, about 90 days, and I can find something that something anti-Semitic happened somewhere in the world, and that's always my hope for them, because if I can bring it, bring it into current events, and then they're done. Like, then they're sold. And by the time they're done, because I love Ellie so much, and he's kind of all over my classroom, they also love Ellie so much, and then they see when swastikas are spray painted, or the flag in our neighborhood, we have a, a Nazi in our neighborhood that flies the swastika flag. Before, they would kind of say things to me like, well, you know, it's America, and if they want to fly, I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. I'm never going to tell you how to feel or how to think about something. But let's explore this for a minute. And by the end of the unit, they're like, he needs to take that flight down. And I'm like, well, he doesn't, but you know. You know. You are a witness, and now you know. And if I can plant one seed of doubt in one kid who decides to stand up to somebody who's anti-Semitic or has anti-Semitic views, I win. I win as a teacher. So again, you saw these, but this is the remnants of what are, um, what are left of the crematoriums. Um, it was extremely humbling to stand here. Every single one of us had a person that we had to report on. And we stood here for a long time and reported story after story after story. One of them being a little boy named Baby Richard, who was transported with a bunch of children without their parents. And he, um, he died in... Oh, I don't want to get it wrong. But I think, it's, I think it was this crematorium here that we stood in and chatted about baby Richard. And of course, as a mom, my question was, who helped him get undressed? Who held him while he died? Who sat with him on the train when he was two years old and scared? Who in their right mind can treat children this way? Children are our future. The Nazis knew that. They knew that if they wiped out the children, the future of the Jewish faith, religion, belief, culture was gone. And they aimed for that. It was a joke for them. They laughed about it. There are terrible pictures of things that they did to babies. Threw them in the air and shot them out of the air. Kicked them into the air while they are. Let them crawl around. Because it was a job, it was a job fueled by hate. We saw this one. So this one is interesting.
interesting to me, and this one gave me a lot of heartburn. I had a lot of nightmares about this one for a long time. These are kind of pits that are all around Birkenau. They're everywhere, and I'm like, oh, like, at first, like, I, I don't like to think that I'm naive, but I kind of went into this trip pretty naive. Like, I'm going to be okay, it's history. I'm going to be able to compartmentalize it. I'm not going to see anything that's going to have a shock factor. It's kind of museum-y. I'm going to be okay. I've been to the Holocaust Museum in D.C. I know what to expect. And uh, a friend of mine, um, an elderly man, said, wow, what a trip you're getting ready to go on. It's going to change your life. And I said, I think I'm going to be good. And he was like, okay, we'll talk about it when you get home. Okay, and I was kind of like, he's weird. And just sort of moved on, like, like, like moved on with my day. Um, these are pits, and these pits come from the ashes, where they dump these ashes. The ashes get so heavy, they push the dirt down. And they leave these bowled out pits. For whatever reason, I'm telling you that God was crying the entire week that we were in Poland. It rained and torrentially downpoured every single day. It was freezing cold. It was June. So not really what I was expecting the weather to be. Maybe it was early July. <coughs> but I, everything was just filled up with water. This was not here. The other thing I said to Cheryl, I was like, I, I'm surprised at how much green space is around. And she said, there wasn't green space then. And I said, well, what, what was it? And she said, it was dirt. If there was any grass that was growing anywhere, the Jews would pull it up and eat it. Mm -hmm. They were starving. Mm -hmm. And so what we see now today is green grass is just kind of how they have re-put um, re it in. But a lot of this is, um, these are mass graves. Mass graves filled with ashes of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of human stories lost. Go ahead. So this is the picture that I'm talking about. I love this little guy. Because here they are, they're sitting, they're waiting. Nobody looks super upset. And here's this little boy, because our babies are so innocent, he has no idea what's about to happen to him. And what is he doing? He's sitting in this grassy, um, open field, and he's picking flowers. And he's trying to get the attention of this little boy across from him, who is wearing the Star of David. And he's trying to hand him whatever it is that he's picking, that he's picking from the earth. And we can see that it's a, it's a flower or a dandelion or something sitting there. And again, it just goes to show you like the innocence, the innocence of children. Go ahead. This is a memorial that is set up for that group of Jews um, that were in the field. This was, um, this was set up to remember them. And these, these memorials are kind of all over Auschwitz. You'll see that a lot of them have stones on the top. Some have roses. Um, there's lanterns. And the story about the stones was one that I loved. I did not understand it. I did not have a huge extensive knowledge of the Jews before the war. I make sure that my students know before we start the Holocaust kind of the history and the culture of the Jews leading up to it because the stories are so cool. But one of the things, and I've seen it in other cemeteries, my grandfather is, um, is buried at Arlington National Cemetery, and when we go and visit him, one of the stones that's just kind of catty-cornered from him, there's always rocks on top of it. And ever since I was a little girl, there's always been rocks on top of it. And I used to want to go over and like wipe the rocks off the top of it. My mom, don't touch that. You know, don't go near it. But I never really understood why. Well, two summers ago, I learned why. The Jews place rocks because the shepherds used to keep rocks in a, like a knapsack and they would count their rocks, and then they would look up, and they would count their sheep. Well, God is the ultimate shepherd, right? And so by laying a rock, you're saying, don't forget my sheep, don't forget my person. And so we took brought rocks from Potter County and laid rocks around Auschwitz. Well, I did from Potter. They did from Chicago and California and all the different places. And we laid rocks from our place when we felt moved or compelled to do that, to say, don't forget this person, don't forget their story. And so I say to my kids all the time, I said, when I'm like 95 and I die, when you come to my funeral, I may bring some flowers, because I do like flowers, but like bring me rocks. And just that way I'll know. And that way you're saying, hey, keep count of my person. And I sort of love that story. And once I kind of understood it, I love it even more. So this is what happens when you do make selection. And again, this stuff is all, like, this is original. This was here at Liberation. And then they have just done things to continue to preserve it. They are not rebuilding at Birkenau and Auschwitz. They're trying to preserve what is left. And so, this floor, you could not walk on the original floor. They had, like, this, like, glass paneling around it. And that's kind of where you walked. 
But this is the story of the people who make selections. So they go in. They get naked. And again, I can compartmentalize that. That's part of history. But here's what I can't compartmentalize. Being a 13 or 12 or 13-year-old child, right? So these are the kids that I teach. Their hormones are raging. Their bodies are changing. They're super embarrassed because they're unsure. And I think about these people walking into these barracks where there's hundreds of other people and being told to strip down naked. I think about myself as a 38-year-old woman, always a little self-conscious, getting stripped down in front of all of these people. I think about kids who are crossing over into that bridge of adulthood. And then to be stood and shaved. As a kid, I thought it was just the hair on my head. Turns out, it's hair everywhere. How embarrassing. How dehumanizing. Because if we all shaved our heads, don't we all look a little similar? And if we all look a little similar, we can all be dehumanized just a little bit more. And then, kind of as you walk through, um, there's places to put your clothes. We're going to wash them for you, and we're going to get them back to you. We'll deliver them right to your barracks. No, they repurpose them um, for something else. So they go in here, the clothes are taken away. They are issued something to wear. I always thought that it was the striped pajamas. For many it is. For some they would like pick prom dresses and fancy dresses and high-heeled shoes. And I said to Cheryl, I said, why aren't they doing that? Like, I don't understand, this is not what I had in my mind. And she said, Debbie, nothing that the Nazis did ever made any sense. If you can pick up a Holocaust book and you can remember that, you're not going to drive yourself crazy. Nothing they did made any sense. They were mean. And so wasn't it funny to try and watch somebody in high-heeled shoes traipse through the mud? And these brown, like these, these wooden cloggy shoes traipse through the mud. They would get a rise out of that. That was funny. And so sometimes you would see them in dresses. You would see them in street clothes. Never their own. Always repurposed. Always maybe a little bit too big. And usually it was the clothes of the people who had come before them and were gone. So as you come through selection, and then the showers, like they would get in, they would stand, and they'd, like the shower heads were above, and like the water maybe sometimes was scorching hot, the water sometimes was maybe scorching cold, and many of these people, again, at the time of liberation, were so sick. They were so sick by the time, um, by the time these camps were liberated. Go ahead. So this is the story of Lily Jacobs. This is Lily Jacobs right here, and she has a liberation story. She's very, very sick on the brink of liberation. And her friends are kind of like taking care of her, taking care of her, taking care of her, because they know that if the Nazis figure out that Lily Jacobs is sick, Lily Jacobs is going to die. She's going to disappear. She's going away. And so they kind of like nurse her and coddle her and coddle her and coddle her. Liberation happens. Lily is sick. She's asleep. She wakes up. She thinks she's dead. She's in like this bed, and she's got these like sheets all around her. And she sits up and she realizes, this is a true story, that she's in the quarters, she's in one of the Nazi quarters. So in my mind, I thought at liberation, we all just run out of the gates and go home. There's no home. Somebody else is in your home. Your stuff has been stolen and gone through. Many of them go back, they try to go back to where they came from in hopes that their family will come back there. Many of them go back and after years realize that nobody's coming back with them. They're alone. I think of like Ellen. So Lily wakes up. She starts kind of rummaging around. Like you can't make this stuff up. She starts kind of rummaging around and she finds this photo book. And she opens it and she starts looking through it. And she says, oh my gosh, there's my grandmother. And she looks and she flips and she looks and she flips and she comes to this picture. Take it of her first roll call at Birkenau. I don't know why these things happen the way they do, but that's the Lily Jacobs story. They then take these pictures, the, the, the album was given to Yad Vashem, and then they took all of these pictures. I have the book, like 10,000 of them, and had them shipped home because I can't find it anywhere. But it has a man came through Birkenau and looked through this album and tried to match the pictures up perfectly with pictures of what it would look like. Um, today. And they're all pictures from the Lily, what they now call or are referred to as the Lily Jacobs album. But if you search it online, if you're interested, the Lily Jacobs album will pop right up for you and you'll see pictures and read Lily's story. It's, it's amazing to me. But again, here she is. You can tell, like, 
you know, we talk to our kids about did, how old, how old is she, and how sad she looks, and her head is down, and she looks defeated and exhausted. And the kids, of course, want to know, but if this is the first roll call, where are their striped pajamas? And so we have that conversation. Maybe they weren't in striped pajamas today. That doesn't necessarily mean that she was never in striped pajamas. It just means that for this picture, she wasn't. Go ahead. And then here she is closer. So this is May of um, 1944. So this is the barracks. And again, the barracks have, um, they have had to re rebuild to some degree, but the barracks are all original. So this is what they would have been like on liberation. And these are the barracks that were not destroyed. Again, when the Nazis knew that it was kind of, you know, the game's up, they burned, they moved people out, and they tried to burn and get rid of as much evidence as they could because they were just going to say, people are crazy, the Russians are making this stuff up, this isn't really how it happened, um, it's all a hoax. Interestingly enough today, we still have people in this world that say it was a hoax. It didn't happen this way. This is a hoax. It's all, they're making it up. They wanted the German, the, the German, the Nazis to look bad. This isn't the way it went. And people still really believe this. One of the newest arguments that I just heard, which I have to laugh or I'll cry kind of thing, is that Anne Frank, the Anne Frank Journal is, is, is garbage because it was written in with a ballpoint pen and they wouldn't have had ballpoint pens at that time. And I'm like, wow, if you have to look that deep into something, you're crazy. It is real. Anne Frank was real. Her family was real. They were in an annex. I do tell my kids when we teach the Holocaust, because we also do Anne Frank and ELA, her story is a one in a million story. The majority of people were not hid like the Frank family. <coughs> this was the majority of the people. She's a one in a million story. It's a great story, but it's a one in a million story. So this is kind of what the barracks looked like. They told us that when we were there, they kind of like said, you know, where would you want to sleep? And everybody sort of had a different answer. If you were on the top, it was open to the outside air. These were like like horse barns. They were they were like livestock barns before they were um, before they were barracks for this. The snow will come in. <coughs> the rain will blow in on you. The people in the top bunk sometimes froze to death. If you were on the bottom bunk, everything from the top bunk came down. If you were on the outside when the Nazis walked through, they would hit you. And so you had that. So I don't really know that there was a very good place. But they packed them in by the thousands. And these are the tradition, like the pictures that you see of all the little faces, you know, that they, that they would take. Go ahead. Um, this is just kind of what it looks like from the inside. This is what a bathroom would look like. Um, the bathroom stories are really, really cool. You want to talk about, like, just not wanting to give up who you are and wanting to continue to humanize yourself. Epic things happened in the bathroom. Marriages happened in the bathroom. Um, there are stories of women having babies. They were able to hide their pregnancy the whole entire time. They had their babies in the bathroom. Mrs. Hamilton, why in the bathroom? Because the Nazis didn't go in there because it was disgusting. They traded things from Canada in the bathroom. And again, upon liberation, this would have just been a place that like, you would stand there and throw up. It would be terrible. And many of them never saw the inside of the bathroom because if you were not in the right spot in line and couldn't get your elbows in to get a spot on the pod, you didn't go. Or you went somewhere else or you figured something else out. So again, this is um, part of the barracks, part of, um, part of Canada. And you can see the barbed wire. Some of this has been reconstructed. They said the guard towers um, were mostly destroyed. And so they're reconstructed so that tourists can see. But it's very interesting. Nobody says, like, if it's not original, they don't tell you that it's original. They say, we reconstructed this. Or at liberation, this was destroyed. Or just before liberation, it was destroyed. And we've reconstructed it to give you an idea. Nobody's trying to keep secrets. But it's interesting that people kind of have that take on it. Because I think that when you get this idea in your head, you want to believe what you want to believe. And you're going to believe it no matter what anybody tells you. And so you're just going to keep spinning it so that you can sleep with it. Go ahead. So this would have been a, a, a meal cart or a cart to move bodies. This is a kitchen because of all of the chimneys. That's how we know. And they would prepare food in there. Um, the Nazis would sometimes like send around, like sometimes you got food and sometimes you didn't. And they would send around this cart 
and it would have broth in it, but the, then they would walk by and like throw mud in it and throw rocks in it, like just to be wickedly mean. The food cart did not always go around, and when they needed the food cart to move bodies, they moved bodies with it, and then the next day they would move food with it. So it was like this multi-purpose, this multi-purpose cart. Um, and again, you couldn't get close to it. They say that this part of the camp, the women's barracks, are sort of sinking in, and the Auschwitz Foundation is trying to figure out ways to preserve it without doing any major restoration because they want it to be as original as it can be. Um, so again, here's a pond. It's a memorial to the lives that were lost. You will see rocks around. Um, and we had a memorial service here and threw, um, threw roses into this, again, open pond. Again, I would say that this was a dumping ground of ashes, and it's just, it filled up with water. So this is Auschwitz, um, like the, the tr like traditional Auschwitz. So that was Birkenau. That Auschwitz is not super far away. Um, I guess I, in my, until I had seen it, I thought that they were sort of all interconnected, and they are, um, but not really. We had to get back on our bus and come, uh, come over a bridge and across some railroad tracks to get to Auschwitz. Um, it was packed when we were here. But it very much looks like a college campus. I don't, like there were, there were trees and there are these brick buildings. Like if you closed your eyes, you would think that you were in a neighborhood somewhere if you didn't know where you were. Very interesting. Very different from Birkenau, which was vast. It was vast and just very um, confusing and quiet. This, I mean, tourists were here like crazy. We had to wait and wait and wait and wait. And then we were just kind of channeled through things. Go ahead. So this is the, you know, work, um, work will set you free. Sign. You can see the um, the upside down B. Okay. Here, see how it's upside down. And then you'll see signs all around danger. Some of it original. Some of it has been restored. Um, a lot of the um, the Holocaust museums have replicas of the signs. And I do believe that this one is not original at Auschwitz. I don't think it's original. I think something happened to the original one. It was stolen. I don't know. Something was happened to it. I don't think this is the original. Go ahead. And this is just kind of what it looks like around camp. Um, this was the largest mass execution. And we just happened to be there on the anniversary of the day. So they had lanterns and had things set up. Um, and there's the memorial and the story of the prisoners that were hung there. Ellie Beisel talks about um, at roll call or during a hanging, they would make um, Jews come out and then make them walk super close to the people that were hung so that they knew, like, this is what's going to happen if you try to escape, if you talk back, if you don't do what you're told, if you ask too many questions kind of thing. Go ahead. Um, pictures of that children had drawn, which I think is interesting because as an adult, we kind of see things through lenses. Children see things through innocence. They don't know any better. And so this is interesting for people who would want to deny. Where is a child in their like wildest dreams going to come up with pictures like that? They're not. Um, this is the book of names. And so um, there's over 6 million names in this book. This book is kept up by Yad Vashem. Um, you can see me up here at the top, the guy that, um, that I researched was Ari Vilner, and I found his name. It says murdered in Warsaw, Poland. And you can see how tall it is. I mean, it goes heights and heights above me and how tiny the names are. And then there's two sides of it. And this is inside one of the barracks at Auschwitz. This is the firing wall at Auschwitz, so they executed a lot of prisoners here. Ellie Weisel and Oprah come and lay a wreath here of flowers. Um, next to it is where Meta, the, the next barracks over here is closed to the public. That's where the medical experiments all happen. Um, terrible things, and they, it's just not open to the public. But you'll also see flowers and memorials laid there at that barracks. Okay. Um, empty Kansas is Icon B. So the inside of the barracks at Auschwitz have been turned into a museum, but it's all original stuff. So this is just like, you can go and see Cans of Zycon at the Holocaust Museum in D.C. If you've not been there, go. Um, it's definitely worth your time. But um, again, this is just, just piles and piles and piles and piles of it. And they've turned these barracks into museum rooms. So when you walk through, there's different things to see. And a lot of this stuff was collected at Liberation. Rooms full of suitcases. And again, 
it's, it's, I think it's a pretty easy argument to be had that they didn't think that they were dying, because if you thought you were dying, why would you take all your stuff? But they took it, and many of them have their addresses on their suitcase and their family last name. And this room was just full of suitcases. And every room kind of had the distinct smell of old. Do you know what I mean? Like, just stuff that was, that, that's old. Um, we were supposed to take pictures here. I took pictures here because I could have, I could have easily Google imaged it, but I wanted the, the kids to know and the people that I speak to know that like I saw this with my own two eyes. Like this is not just a Google image. It is not made up. It is not fake. Um, these are human remains of hair. This is Hamilton. What were they doing with hair? Stuffing pillows, repurposing it, using it for anything that they could use. They would shave their heads, but the hair was worth something. And so they used it. So this is an entire room of hair. And again, I will tell you, I wasn't super worried about seeing it until I saw it, and then I felt like someone punched me in my guts. I walked out of here, and it took all I had. Like, I got that sick, nauseous, all I had to not throw up. However, in looking around at all of these camps, because we, we did Auschwitz, we did Birkenau, we did Treblinka, um, we did the city streets of Tarnow, we did Krakow, we did the Warsaw Ghetto, the Lowish Ghetto, um, Kalis, uh, Helno, and there weren't tons of tourists, but at Birkenau there were people brought to their knees by what they saw, even 75 years after liberation. So it still very much feels, there's, there's the human element is there, you can very much feel it. And I think about how much, even on a bad hair day, like, my hair makes me who I am. <coughs> Some of you, right? Like, your hair make, makes you who you are, you like your hair, even on its worst day. And if I want to shave it off, then it's okay. But if someone's going to force me to do that, then that's not okay, right? Because we all have that human, that human independent spirit. We don't want people to tell us what to do. These people had just choiceless choice. Sure, they had choiceless choices, but their choices <coughs> were all made for them. Go ahead. Eyeglasses. Go ahead. Dishes. So this was an entire room. You kind of were like on this bridge thing at the, um, and you sort of looked over, and it just was like as deep and wide, full of dishes. And again, if I know I'm going to my death, am I going to pack my kitchen up? No. Maybe I'm going to take like my grandmother's heirloom jewelry and I'm going to take my wedding bands and I'm going to take like things, the most precious things to me. They thought they were being relocated somewhere that they were going to need dishes. This is evidenced by a room full of dishes. And this isn't even all of them. This is just a sampling of dishes. This is not all of them. Again, stolen. Stolen and at liberation found, kept and now memorialized. <coughs> baby's clothes, right? <coughs> if I'm taking my baby somewhere, I have to pack my baby's clothes. So there's also um, remnants of children's clothes, children's shoes. And then there's the famous room of shoes. If you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., um, it's still moving. There was something a little bit more moving about this. DC's shoes aren't climate controlled, so they're kind of breaking down a little bit more because, again, you can only preserve as much as you can preserve. Time is going to age things. Um, but here, this is all like in this climate controlled room. And I can't imagine at liberation, first of all, seeing countless bodies, people that were completely skeletal, but then the evidence of what happened before we got there. The shoes. And you can kind of look through, and as I kind of looked through, these little red shoes spoke to me. And I think it's because my daughter had little red shoes one year um, with a Christmas dress that were just like that. These patent leather little red shoes, right? So it's been 75 years since liberation. But even still, we can make connections to fashions. As moms, right? Our hearts feel the same way about our children as those moms felt about their children and dads, the same thing. And so those little red shoes kind of spoke to me the whole, like the whole time we stood there. And it was, it was here at this moment that I was exhausted. We had been there for seven days and a major time change. I was exhausted physically. I was exhausted emotionally. 
Um, at times I was a little bit frustrated and a little bit mad. I was all cried out. And it occurred to me that I have three children, myself and my husband. My husband would have been selected for work, no doubt in my mind. He's strong, he's tall, he's blonde hair, blue eyed, so even if we were Jewish, he maybe could pass for not. <clears throat> they selected him to work for a while. I automatically, I automatically would have had to go to the crematorium because somebody had to take their kids. And it would have been me. And then I was done for the day. Like I was just done. I was done for the day. It was over for me. Because until you feel it, you can't feel it. And it became super important to me at this moment, staring at these shoes, looking at these shoes, that every single pair of shoes had a story on that day that they were taken. And then it's up to me to plant a seed for somebody else to get interested and start reading stories and start remembering stories. Not just about the heroes, but about people who are just doing their everyday life, right? Just doing their everyday life, making Saturday dinner, cleaning up the house. Just living their everyday life, wearing their shoes. <laughs> Shaving brushes. <clears throat> um, this is Rudolf Hess, um, where he would have stayed just outside the perimeter of the camp. We did not spend a lot of time talking about the perpetrators, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it today. Um, when he goes on trial, he basically says, every time I was at the camp, things were status quo. Okay. They basically decide that that's not true, and they hang him. I love this part of the story. Go ahead. They bring him back to Auschwitz, and they hang him there. And right next to, the next thing I'm going to show you, right next to is um, a crematorium. And so this is what the crematorium looked like. And so why, my first question is, well, why didn't they destroy that one so that when the liberators come, like, they're going to know? <coughs> they didn't destroy this one because they used it as a bomb shelter for a little while, and they had a purpose for it. And so they used it. So, for better or for worse, now we have it. We have it as evidence, we have it as testimony, and even though it's sort of weird, I wanted to walk through it. I wanted to know what it was like. And so I did. So this is the door. This one looks very different from Birkenau, but this is the door. And they kind of wait, and they're sort of shuffled in. You can see that there's even like a porch light. And, but again, you can see that the roof is flat, and you can you, that it, the earth came up over top of it. So again, there would be guards standing on the roof. And this is what it looks like inside. So this, is the, like, this would be the place where I would take my clothes off. And then you kind of move in. And there, were, um, and there was a thing outside that said you have to remain absolutely silent through here. Like there, were, there was no talking, there was no fooling, like no nothing. And it was, I mean, it was eerily silent. And there were hundreds of us. And it was not a big space. There was a memorial where people left rocks. And you just sort of kind of walked through. So again, you can see very basic. It's very basic. And I say to kids, if your will and determination to kill people is strong enough, you don't need much to make it happen. It hell no. They destroyed that. They didn't want any evidence of that camp. They used the exhaust. They used gas vans and killed people. They didn't need bullets. They didn't need guns. They didn't need knives. They just needed the ingenuity. And really, the only reason they needed the ingenuity is because they wanted to kill a lot of people the fastest way possible. Mass extermination. And this is what the inside of mass extermination looks like. Go ahead. So you can see here, here's the shoe where they would dump, um, drop the Zyklon B canister down. It would fall to its side. That would release the poisonous gas. They would close this up once the canisters were in. And then they would wait. And then the Zonder commando would go in and, as fast as they could, clean it out. And then you kind of walk through. And this is, um, this is what the oven system looks like. And again, they just try to keep them as original as they could to the time period. Go ahead. 
And so Zakor in um, Hebrew means remember. And I took a walk that nobody that came in by train got to take, and I walked out of Birkenau on the train tracks. It took me probably an extra 20 minutes compared to my group. A couple of us did it. And I knew that there was a reason that I was number 21 on a trip that they were only taking 20. And I knew that there was a reason that somebody backed out of that trip. And I wasn't really sure when I got on the plane and left Krakow to fly to Warsaw, to fly back to Toronto. I wasn't really sure what that was. And it took me a long, long time to put my head around what it meant. But I knew that I was a witness. And I knew that if I could say to my kids, to my babies, I call them, and they're like, we're not babies, we're in seventh grade. To my babies, that yes, this did happen. Yes, hate is extreme. And when you really hate something, you can be forced to do anything. Or you could be willing to do anything. Because hate is strong. But by God, isn't love stronger? Yeah. And can't we move mountains with love? Yeah. If you'll try. And so I tie this into our anti-bullying curriculum. And I tie this into our kindness curriculum. And I just constantly try to find common threads through history to help my kids connect, to show them what kindness looks like, and to show them that hate is not the answer. The Nazis did not win. They did not win, but Mrs. Hamilton, they killed six million people that they wanted to kill. Like, that's a big number. You're right, that is a big number. That is a number that is crippling. But they didn't win, because Ali Wiesel told the story and because I told the story, and because you guys are here today, and you're going to tell the story. And you're going to set the record straight. If we would have all just shut up about it, and continued to march on and say, yeah, that was a terrible time period in history. Wow, that was terrible. Then you're right, the Nazis won. But if we can take one person's story, and remember it, and put it in our heart forever, and carry it, they lose. And every time one of us does that, they continue to lose 75 plus years later. And I'm not going to stop until I know they lost. Swastika flags are for museums. We should not be flying them on our property. It's not the place for it. It's up to us to stand up to hate. The United States um, Holocaust Memorial Museum picks kind of a different platform. I don't know how often they do it. But um, I was also selected, so I went to Poland, not this past summer, the summer before. And this summer, I was a Belfer scholar and traveled to the um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and studied there for a bunch of days. We had the museum all to ourselves, like in the wee early hours of the morning. It was really cool. And their message um, this year and their campaign is, what you do matters. And so when my kids say, yes, there's genocide happening all over the world. I'm a seventh grader at Northern Potter. What can I do about that? And I said, but if you tell one person, hey, have you read about what's going on in Syria? Have you then become a voice? Have you then started to ask the question? Are you then doing something? <coughs> and they're like, huh. If you are kind to somebody, if somebody spouts off hateful rhetoric, and you just very kindly put them back on track, are you not doing something? Are you not being a voice? So I leave you with this, what you do matters. It's important for us to remember. It's important for us to remember never again. These people did not ask for this. They were people just like you and me. <coughs> Thanks for coming out on Saturday. Night. That is the reason this museum is here. Uh, and if you study the Holocaust, these, these guys at Yad Vashem and the Shoah Foundation, all these people, they all say the same thing. Don't be a bystander. Be an upstander. Because you, if you allow this to happen, you're complicit. If you talked about the perpetrators, it's one of the things that really bothers me the most about the Holocaust. Less than 10% of the perpetrators were ever brought to justice. Less than 10%. They'll face the ultimate judge someday. But less than 10% of the perpetrators of the Holocaust were ever brought to trial or brought to justice. And many of those that were, were given lenient sentences. Many of them lived to be ripe old age. So our mission, again, by our founder, is to teach young people about the war, why it was fought, who fought it, and what it was about, and to make sure, hopefully, it never happens again. 
And thank God there's teachers out there in our schools that are making that impact on kids. As she said, you plant one seed. One little seed. I remember third grade over here at elementary school, Mrs. Shields. She planted that seed. I can't get enough books. It was all because of her. So each individual here, you've been here today to see this presentation. It shows me that you care enough to make the effort to come and see this presentation. Now we ask for you, we challenge you to go out there and live it. Pass it forward, pay it forward as they say, and make sure that this never happens again. And next month, 